This session is called All By Myself, Is Loneliness a Social Problem? Loneliness seems to be a growing problem. It's described as a killer on a worldwide scale. It's described as the biggest public health problem we face compared even to obesity or cancer or heart disease. It's described as an epidemic. Uh, in the UK, we're described by the Office of National Statistics as the loneliness, the loneliness capital of Europe. So there's clearly uh, a sense in which the problem of loneliness has got worse in recent times. But is it a problem for which there are solutions that we can engineer? Or is it just part of life, something that we have to endure? Or some might argue, enjoy in terms of enjoying our own solitude. So I have a, a distinguished panel who will be speaking. My name is Dave Clements. Uh, I'll be chairing. I am founder of the Social Policy Forum at the Institute of Ideas. The speakers I'll introduce in the order that they will be speaking. First, to my far left, is Beverly Marshall. She is a volunteer with the Samaritans. She's also the producer of this session. She'll be speaking in a personal capacity. On my near left is Laura Alcock Ferguson. She is director of the Campaign to End Loneliness. On my immediate right, is Abbott Christopher Jameson, uh, recently elected Abbott President of the English Benedictine Congregation and author of Finding Sanctuary and Finding Happiness. And on my far right, that doesn't represent his views, that's just the position on the table, is Josh Lowe, who is a staff writer with Newsweek. The Social Policy Forum and Newsweek are sponsoring this session. So, I'll um, immediately hand it over to Beverly to get us started. So I want to argue two points today. First, I don't think it's helpful to view people who are feeling lonely as vulnerable. In fact, cultivating this self-concept could be counterproductive. Second, I think it's important that we all take responsibility for one another and support those who are trying to overcome their loneliness and social isolation. One of the major issues for me on the discussion on loneliness is that it's often assumed that um, those that are experiencing it are vulnerable and incapable of addressing their situation without um, some psychological intervention. As such, campaigns which foreground the notion of vulnerability might well be counterproductive insofar that they discourage those who are feeling lonely from seeing themselves capable of taking the action required to resolve their situation. I believe that nearly all of us will experience loneliness at some point in our lives, and I think nearly all of us have the ability to overcome and address this. Um, I myself remember being 17 years old. I lived in a shared house in a part of London that had not previously been my home. My best friend had moved to Northampton to be with her boyfriend. My mum had moved to America to stop being a parent, I think. And my two sisters were enjoying their 20s uh, away with boyfriends and friends and parties. Um, and I remember a particularly difficult weekend where it was May bank holiday weekend. And I remember being in this house all on my own, staring at the four walls. I um, went to the supermarket and I went to the library. And that was at the only outing for the weekend because I had no friends. And I came back with a Nina Simone album, and I played that repeatedly because it really summed up, Nina's brilliant, she really summed up that kind of emotional feeling that I had. Um, and I still turn to her today whenever I'm feeling something. Um, and that was a, a really down moment for me. Uh, but things did change from that point. Those feelings of loneliness that were overwhelming me were, were something I had to do something about. They propelled me, and I decided to try and find um, a friend uh, because I'd started a new job and I didn't know anyone. I also decided that actually it probably was worth me not spending too much time on my own, so I decided to get a job in a pub where I'd be surrounded by people and maybe make some uh, new acquaintances. I was lucky because I was young, healthy, in central London, uh, so my ability to resolve my problems was much more simple than someone who's maybe elderly, uh, limited mobility, or someone who has a condition that hinders their ability to make uh, relationships with, with other people. 
Uh, I appreciate that and can see that loneliness can be more challenging for other groups of people. However, whilst I think it's important to have empathy and compassion for people who are feeling lonely, I think that the person feeling the loneliness <coughs> is ultimately the only person able to resolve their problem. I think also that we have an innate responsibility to make our own lives rewarding, which we can't avoid. Anybody going through feelings of loneliness needs to grapple with these feelings and find a way through. I'm a fan, um, and so is Michael Caine, one of my favourites, of the mantra, if you're going through hell, keep going. I also think that pain can have a positive impact on us. It makes us act. No one wants to experience feelings of despair, but it has a transformation, uh, tra transformative uh, and creative potential. It takes us on a journey to solve our problems. The answer, it seems to me, is the realisation that you need to act in order to connect with people. And I appreciate that that can be overwhelming. I'm not underestimating that. Uh, but the need for enriching social relationships um, is a really good one. Um, in my early 20s, I went and lived on a kibbutz for a year in Israel. And I remember meeting a Holocaust, a Holocaust survivor who told me the awful things she'd been through in a camp, how she'd shared beds with people who were dying or dead. And I asked her how she got through it. And she told me that because she could get up in the morning, she did. It was as simple as that. And this um, has stayed with me um, because it's testament to the human condition's ability to cope with the most difficult, upsetting and traumatic experiences. Obviously, most people will not go through the uh, experience that the old lady relayed to me, but people at some point in their lives will go through strong, upsetting emotions that I think most people have the ability and capacity to deal with without being medicalised or resolved of the responsibility to get on and fight through. People can go through painful situations and get through them, and I don't think we should downplay that. I think it's important to remember how resilient the individual is. Human solidarity is also an important and contributes to an environment in which people flourish um, and are not overlooked and left on their own. But it can only do so much. Individual autonomy, acting and making and um, finding connections with people is essential. I think we play up fragility today. And I want to make the case for seeing people as much more resilient. I think we undermine people's sense of agency when we overstate their incapacities. We need a bit more positivity, a greater sense of how wonderful and creative people are. Um, and this brings me to my final point, which I'm simply going to assert. We all have a responsibility for one another. And there's a great deal that we as individuals can do to support those who are trying to overcome their loneliness and social isolation. Individuals have a role, communities have a role, and so do charities and the state. I believe that charities and the state should be supporting people who are experiencing loneliness and socialisation, and both can facilitate social interaction and bonding. Um, however, given that funding is an issue, I want to make a case for specific resources being prioritised to the elderly, those struggling with mental health and mobility issues. As I think it is easier for <coughs> young people and middle-aged people to change their lives. I also think <coughs> that today's society offers a lot of uh, positive opportunities to make connections because of new technology uh, and changing social norms. And all of this is progressive. Our view of society is much more negative than I think is warranted. We should be celebrating our sociability, not decrying it. I would like to tell you about a moment um, during my maternity leave about three years ago where I met a woman about 15 years older than me who was a grandmother. Um, because apparently I'm a geriatric mother when I had my kids <laughs> over 35. And um, let's call her Jill. I didn't know her very well then. Um, and she was in the playground um, with her granddaughter, Ellie. Um, 
Ellie was a bit older than my daughter, about four at the time, I think, and she really wanted to. She was looking at this group of older girls and she really wanted to go and make friends. And I knew Jill, we, we sing in the same um, co choir. Um, and I knew her from, you know, from that kind of setting. She, she, she sits in the row behind me, we nod to each other. We didn't know each other very well at the time, but I knew her enough to know that um, she had suffered a bereavement about three years before her husband had died. And she leant over to her granddaughter and said, do you want to go and make friends? And Ellie was saying, yeah, you know, looking, at, looking with big wide eyes at the, the group of older girls. And Jill said, um, just go and, go and say, my name's Ellie, can I play? And to me, it seemed like such a simple statement but also quite scary, quite a bold thing for anyone to say. How, I mean, how many of you have met new people today and just gone up and said, my name's Laura, do you want to talk? Or do you want to play? <laughs> <laughs> um, I imagine you've all come here with someone you know, or a few people that you know, and although you know, it's a great forum for us to debate and discuss, um, we often come away not necessarily having swapped phone numbers or whatever we swap these days um, to stay in touch with someone. But there was someone who'd suffered such loss and who I knew had gone through um, a real period of feeling alone, um, giving advice to her, you know, to, to do two generations down about the basics of connection, which I thought was, I thought was beautiful. At the time, I was, as I said, I was on maternity leave, and um, this fantastic job that I'm, I've been lucky to have for the last seven years um, was being caretaken by someone else, which I liked, but also wanted it back. I was, you know, I was ready to come back, and, but I knew my own disconnection, my feeling of not having a place, um, or the same place that I'd had, because our work often defines us. I knew that that feeling that feeling of loss, my own f sense of aloneness. It wasn't wholly loneliness because I was surrounded by kids, I was surrounded by new mums, but I definitely could associate with our jobs, our careers, defining us and defining who we are in the same way that people who retire after being in the same job for years, decades, suddenly feel of no value to their communities. So I, I could absolutely associate with that. But the distinction for me was, it was time limited, I still had contact with work, and within five months I was back in the job. Five months later though, Jill was still bereaved. Um, because this is not something that goes over any amount of time. You can't say, I know that's gonna end here, or there, or then. And there are millions of people who feel lonely some of the time or all of the time. Uh, over 1.2 million older people feel chronically lonely. And it's that chronic loneliness um, which has caught the attention of health bodies, public health bodies, um, and most recently um, the Royal College of General Practitioners, the Royal College of GPs spokesperson has compared loneliness with having a long-term health condition. It's also been compared to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and has been said to be worse for us than obesity. And because of the sheer numbers of people who are involved, it, it is um, a public health issue. And like most, all public health issues, there are a number of places that where responsibility for tackling this issue lies. And Yes, for big public health issues like this, they have to be addressed um, by health bodies nationally. They have to be understood by GPs locally, in our own local area. A high proportion of GPs in this country state that the number of people coming to them, older people coming to them, um, about loneliness is rising, um, and yet it's not recognised, of course, it's not a health condition, but it, has, it harms our health. So the responsibility lies definitely with health bodies, because this is an issue that harms our health and costs 
our health service. It's responsibility not for them to cure it as such, but to know where to direct those people. And it's that direction that Jill, thankfully, was um, able to receive. She was um, referred to a bereavement counselling service. And that counselling service was very well versed in um, talking about loneliness as part of the bereavement process. And so her need for talking, her need for um, just having someone to talk through her feelings with, it wasn't something she wanted to burden her friends with. She kept singing, she kept seeing her grandchildren, but she needed a, a safe space. That was something that she could find. And she took the responsibility to ask for it, look after herself, and see her way through it. See her way through to give, go on to give her granddaughter advice. So it's a shared responsibility between the person who feels lonely, who's in the grip of loneliness, and with health bodies and all of us around those people, those 1.2 million chronically older people who are feeling lonely right now in the UK. Thank you, Laura. Christopher. I wonder what the monastic tradition which, which I live and which I, I come from can offer to the question of loneliness. The loneliness of bereavement is very particular, and you, um, you've spoken about it very beautifully, Laura, in the, that story. And similarly, too, the, the loneliness of old age. Those are um, very serious issues, and there's no quick fix at all. But what I wonder is, can some of the insights from the monastic tradition, which is, as you know, not solely a Christian phenomenon, it's a human phenomenon around the world and across many different religious traditions. What can we learn from, from it that might prepare us to handle some of these issues? Not to solve them, but to make us more resilient when they come. As, as um, Beverly said, we will all face traumatic and painful experiences and they can become sources of growth rather than sources of diminishment. The first one is then from the monastic tradition is to look at aloneness, being alone. Um, the word monk comes from the same origin as the word monarch, namely a person alone. And so one of the things that uh, we learn as monks is how to be alone but not be lonely. And I think learning how to be alone without being lonely is a really important skill. What we find with visitors, because as St. Benedict said one and a half thousand years ago, guests are never lacking in a monastery. And still today, people flock to monasteries. It's one of the bizarre features of modern life is that the less religious our culture becomes, the more people want to visit monasteries. Um, people say things like, I don't like organized religion, and yet they come to monasteries and I say, boy, we are organized religion. <laughs> A bell goes and you do stuff. We're positively Pavlovian. Uh, but apparently monasteries are the acceptable face of religion nowadays. But we do specialize really in how to be alone without being lonely. And for us, it's to do with facing demons. Uh, incidentally, we're the people who invented the phrase, facing your demons. Um, I'm not sure people in Hollywood know that when they talk about it. But it was the first Christian monks of the, uh, third and well, of the fourth century who said that when you are alone in the desert in Egypt, you find these demons rising up, the demons of anger, gluttony, greed, and so on. And they found that with nobody else around, the problem was inside themselves. You know, it was the day that one of the monks found himself getting angry with a knife that was not sharp enough, that he had this blinding revelation that the problem was not the knife, the problem was himself. And when we can face the fact that a lot of our demons actually are things we need to face on our own with the help of others, but we can live alone more truthfully and with greater peace if we will face our demons and be enabled to face them with the support of other wise people. Now, 
alongside that, there is the rise of mindfulness. Um, a, a, a monks are quite cross, really, because we've discovered that a man's created a telephone app for mindfulness and become a millionaire. And we just think, well, why didn't we put our monastic tradition into an app and sell it for money? Because I think the reality is, it seems that if you don't put a price on something nowadays, apparently it's not valuable. <coughs> we'll teach you about mindfulness for free. But apparently that wouldn't be valuable. So the ability to meditate is one of the other key features. Facing your demons, firstly, and then secondly, the ability to focus your mind where you want to focus it. Because that's what meditation teaches you. It teaches you the ability not to be distracted the whole time by things you can't be bothered with, like, you know, did I remember to switch off the gas? Um, I wonder what I'm going to do for my holiday next year. Um, does that boy or girl really like me? And so on. If you want to focus on something, meditation teaches you how to focus, and in the Christian tradition, to focus on God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But that ability then to face demons and then focus on what you want, not what comes to you, is actually a really important liberation to learn to be alone without being lonely. Then the second element that the monastic tradition offers to make us resilient about loneliness is living in a community of people you did not choose. I live with 22 other monks. I would not have chosen the other 21. <laughs> okay. Come to think of it, I don't think I'd have chosen the 22nd. But <laughs> the reality is, learning to live in those wider fellowships, that's the only, we don't have a better word for it in English, it's a very sexist word, but we still use it, those wider fellowships, which in our culture used to be represented by trade unions, by churches, even by political parties. I met a conservative councillor recently who told me she only joined the conservative party because they had the best dances in the town. Well, great reason for being a conservative was the social connections. Without these wider fellowships, we struggle to overcome loneliness. Now, I think our culture has so diminished those wider fellowships that too much emphasis falls into friendship and family. And when the friendship and the family are, are <coughs> under pressure, there's nowhere else to go. And so organizations like the Samaritans do an amazing job offering a place to go. But it would be better if our culture could learn how to live with neighbors. Whatever happened to neighbors, well, it was a TV soap that didn't go very far, but what happened to proper neighbors, we need better neighbors as one of the ways. Building up neighborhoods is an obvious way to make us more resilient to loneliness. So I offer you the ability to be alone and the ability to create connections with neighbors and people I did not choose, but who can be part of a wider fellowship. Okay. Josh. Um, so we've heard some uh, wonderful summaries of the broad problem of loneliness, but I, I wanted to focus in on one, how one extreme reaction to it among a small minority is manifesting itself as a social problem today. Um, I'll begin with some words from a YouTube diary uh, recorded by an angry, emotionally immature and self-professedly lonely young man. He said, for the last eight years of my life, ever since I've hit puberty, I've been forced to endure an existence of loneliness, rejection, and unfulfilled desires. So far, so unremarkable, the sort of thing you might find all over Reddit or teenagers' MySpaces back in my day. Uh, the only reason anyone would be quoting it in a talk like this is because of what the young man who recorded it uh, did in real life. Shortly beforehand, he had stabbed his three housemates to death. Shortly afterwards, he drove around the Californian coastal community of Isla Vista, killing three more people with gunshots and his car, wounding 14 and ultimately taking his own life. His name, as you might remember if you followed the case at the time, was Elliot Roger, um, and he explained his motives in that video, uh, as well as in a sprawling, <coughs> tedious manifesto that he posted online. Uh, Girls, he said, all I ever wanted is to love and to be loved by you. You denied me a happy life, and in turn, I will deny all of you life. Today we're talking about whether loneliness is a social problem, and I think it is one. I think it takes many forms, and obviously the vast majority of people who suffer from loneliness don't respond to their situation with hatred at all, let alone the sort of destructive loathing that that young man exhibited. But I think, and this is something that's been remarked upon by a lot of smarter commentators than me recently, that there is a particular reaction to romantic loneliness and um, 
sexual rejection among young men in it, it, it today that is worthy of attention. It's the reaction that says, I can't get a girlfriend, so women must be stupid or defective or hateful, and society at large must be a sham. It's worthy of attention because it helped drive Elliot Roger to do what he did and has likely influenced other crimes against women, um, but it's also helping even influence mainstream politics. As far as the latter point goes, we might look at the uh, amorphous collective of far-right groups online called the alt-right that are widely acknowledged to have played a part in the election of Donald Trump. Shortly after Trump's election, the writer Siyanda Mahatsiwa described on Twitter what she'd observed in the tangle of forum threads and social media channels where the alt-right largely exist. She spoke of a concerted effort to radicalize lonely young men. These online groups, she said, found young white men at their most vulnerable and convinced them liberals were colluding to destroy white Western manhood. To take one example, the Reddit community where men who are unable to find romantic partners bemoan their uh, involuntary celibacy, as they call it, or incel for short, uh, began life as a sort of support group uh, for some members whose only crime is a bit of woeful self-absorption. That is all it still is. But you don't need to look beyond the first page of that community to find examples of raging misogyny interlaced with self-disgust. On the day I did my final research for this talk, one post caught my eye related to Elliot Roger himself. It was some fan art of him and a poster had written underneath, how many started reading My Twisted World, which is the title of Roger's manifesto, um, ironically, and quickly realized no one has ever understood and related to them as much as the Rog. So it seems that many among the incel community had begun from a place of loneliness, progressed from there to rage. And, as Siyanda Mohatsiwa wrote in the thread I quoted earlier, from this place, some of them, though many in the community insist it's a minority, progressed to actual political extremism via the alt-right. This is a panel about loneliness, not the far right, but I think the journey some of these men take from loneliness to extremism highlights a failure to adjust to a world in which young men are no longer entitled to romantic attachment. It's not unheard of, for example, for members of the incel community to bemoan the demise of earlier, even more patriarchal societies than our own, which afforded men through for ex uh, sex through, for example, arranged marriages or even female slaves captured in war. So I've discussed extreme cases here, but some of these attitudes <laughs> are not so different um, in kind, if, 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 it, if in degree, to words I've heard expressed by men of my acquaintance. So what to do about it? Well, I think it's a reminder that it's a responsibility on all of us, um, not only to help people to stop becoming lonely, but to help them to deal with loneliness in a healthy way. And it's a reminder to change through whatever tools at your disposable the way young men think about romance and women and loneliness. Teach them that women are independent people whose choices, even when those choices do not benefit them, are valid and that resenting them for their choices is illogical and immoral. Teach them that lacking sex and romance and even loneliness are tolerable. There can be an opportunity for self-development or even a provocation for self-change. And teach them that in any case, sex and romance and human connection are desirable only insofar as they bring happiness, not as signifiers of social status. As I've said, this is one facet of the global social problem of loneliness. It's a minority, but it's one that's already led to tragic deaths and may have direct, indirectly influenced a US presidential election. So I don't want to see what else will happen if it's left unchecked. Thank you, Josh. OK, I'll, I'll resist the urge to chip it myself at this stage. So can I um, go out to the audience? Um, I thought what you said at the end was quite interesting about the, the murderer, um, the fact that he wrote um, my, basically my loneliness is your fault. He said to these girls, you know, you made me lonely. Um, I think that was quite interesting. Um, I work in a large uh, university, and in, uh, kids coming into first year often get referred to counselling because they're lonely, um, and they're, you know, suffering from anxiety. And what I can really see there is that loneliness and their loneliness is becoming up, is being pathologised. It's been kind of a turned into a disease. When in actual fact, it's quite a normal thing. Um, and that, that troubles me because um, if you're saying it's something that's pathologized and, and it's turned into a kind of illness or disease, what you're basically saying is that someone else has to deal with this. Someone else has to sort this out. Um, and I think kids coming through schools nowadays, whenever things like that happen to them, whenever they feel anxious, whenever they feel lonely, or whenever they feel uh, what are 
very ordinary everyday human emotions, they're actually told, well, actually someone else will sort that out. And I think the problem here is when um, the, the authorities, whether it's schools or universities or, or even uh, charities or the government, um, say to us, well, that's actually a big social problem. What we'll sort it out. Um, what you're actually doing is taking away the imperative for people to act for themselves. And I think that that's the problem that we face at the moment, that people are thinking, well, I feel lonely. Instead of just treating it as something that they've got and they have to go, they have to go over it themselves, have to find their own way out of it, then it, they're being told that it is a bigger problem than what it is. And it, it is, they've been told it's some kind of illness. And therefore, it's someone else's responsibility to sort it. And I think that's at the root of the problem that we face here, that we have to be left to sort these things ourselves. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make a couple of points agreeing with the last speaker and also in relation to what Beverly said because I also work in a university and I've noticed with students there is a tendency more and more for academics not to be encouraged to advise them, um, to send them straight to counselling and to treat them like you say as though they're very fragile and I think if you'd sort of suggested that perhaps loneliness might be a normal part of the human condition, you'd probably be seen to be extremely harsh. Now, I was very struck by the difference between the way the students were treated and the staff were treated over the summer because my particular university, there were huge cuts, right? So lots of staff, including myself, uh, jobs were under threat. Now, what I was offered was not counselling, but resilience training, <laughs> which I thought was, was quite interesting. And I took it, luckily I didn't lose my job, and I took the resilience training, and I thought, wow, this is really interesting, because they were talking about post-traumatic growth, more emphasis on what you could do to empower yourself, and the strengths that you had as an individual. And I thought, gosh, okay, maybe the staff who are under threat for losing their jobs are older than the students. But I thought I was very struck by the way we treated our students, sort of in terms of fragility, pathologization of any emotional states, which deep down you might think, okay, I'd like to say something different about this, but I'm not being encouraged to say that because we're encouraged to send them straight off to counseling and push them into that, that kind of package of care immediately. And what I was offered, which I think might actually be quite useful for them as well. So, you know, I was just interested because it seemed like the only time that you talk about resilience is when there's a sort of neoliberal push on getting rid of staff and restructuring and not where it might be also quite useful, not saying other forms of counselling aren't, but just dealing with the students that might have actually quite normal um, uh, experiences at starting university that are quite distressing for them, but which you don't immediately, like you say, have to uh, pathologise when there might be other approaches that could be more useful. All right, um, I just wanted to share a quick story, if that's all right. Um, when I was a GCSE student, um, I was really badly paved, and the teacher um, asked me to stay behind after the lesson for a detention, and she asked me to write um, a, st uh, a story about a day in the life of a beach pebble. Um, and at the time, I was sort of like, okay, okay, right, let's ju let's just do this. Let's see what I can um, get out of this. Um, so basically, I end up writing about. Um, a beach pebble, one particular beach pebble, who felt really lonely, even though they were surrounded by so many others like themselves. Um, they still didn't feel like they had a place on the beach, etc. And then basically, um, sort of a few weeks later, I sort of realised maybe that was a reflection of my mental health and my situation. And I think that that just, because that hasn't really been touched on so far, about how even though you could have so many friends, you could have a partner, um, you could have a lot of family, you could still be lonely, and that um, having, like really amazing support networks and social relationships doesn't necessarily equate to uh, like a decline in loneliness. If anything, I've, I don't know about anyone else here, but I've felt that the more I'm surrounded by more people, the more lonely I feel because there's more scope to feel more like emotionally, you know, relatively deprived. So. Thank you. Okay. About three or 4,000 people live within five minutes walk of this art centre and we're all 
residents of the City of London, either in the Barbican or Golden Lane Estate. And three years ago, the city commissioned a report on loneliness in the area from uh, Goldsmith College, which indicated there were very high levels of loneliness in this area. And in some ways, it's not surprising, because most of the, um, certainly in Golden Lane Estate, most of the flats are bedsits or single occupancy, and there aren't any streets, and people generally don't have cars, and there are very few people who will take their children to school. So a lot of the more conventional ways of meeting people are lost. So I suppose my question to the panel is, in, one is I think there's a high level of loneliness in this neighborhood, but it can't be proved. But my question to you is, uh, what is the influence of the way in which buildings like Golden Lane and the Barbican mm -hmm. are designed in addressing loneliness? And are there ways in which the communities that live here might be able to take particular measures that acknowledge the way in which this area has its particular history and the way the buildings are designed? This question around pathologization, which I think, Laura, is perhaps something which you, you may want to respond to, um, this notion that um, loneliness is, is being pathologized yeah. Um, there's like a diseaseification, you might call it, of the problem of loneliness, and this, this, this treating of it as a public health problem on a par with other major areas of concern around cancer and heart disease. So perhaps, do you want to come back on, on that particular point or anything else that you've heard so far? Yeah. The campaign was, was set up and launched seven years ago by four older people's charities, and they came together because, not because there was nothing going on around loneliness for older people, there was a lot going on, but they knew that <clears throat> the issue wasn't being taken as seriously as it could be. Um, now, I don't disagree with a lot of what's been said, um, and I really appreciate all the questions, because often from these, these events, I go away and um, kind of my views on the, the issue are radically transformed in some way. But I still haven't met anyone who's been able to convince me that we shouldn't be talking about loneliness harming our health. Um, seven years ago, there was almost as much evidence as there is today about loneliness harming our health, about it being linked to um, leading to high blood, high blood pressure, being linked to early um, and, in, and an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. There's an obvious and um, unfortunately um, uh, circular relationship with depression. It harms our health. And if we don't acknowledge that, then I'm afraid um, bodies like um, <coughs> Public Health England, who, who do still, in these straightened times, have budgets to be able to prevent um, these more serious, if you like, um, medicalized diseases um, of high blood pressure and Alzheimer's, if they're preventing loneliness at an early stage, then maybe they're preventing some of those more, frankly, more costly diseases, um, true diseases, later on um, down the line. So there are organisations out there who, who could take responsibility for um, early action on chronic loneliness, really chronic loneliness, on someone who cannot get out of the house because they've got other health issues, and yet it is the stress the high blood pressure caused by their loneliness that's probably going to kill them early. Can I just be clear? So you're you actually saying that loneliness itself creates these medical problems, or are you saying it's associated with them in some way? There's been a study of uh, a meta-analysis of 148 um, worldwide studies, and um, those, those studies tracked um, mortality, and the rates of mortality were equivalent to um, people smoking, and were worse than obesity. So that's one study. So, uh, and that's not saying that it's causing, it's just comparing with other um, public health issues. Um, there are other studies that show that loneliness, I mean, it, it's, we're social animals. So in that sense, I agree with many of, many of you on what you've said. We are here on the planet mostly to, to socialize, to connect. Um, it feels good to connect. Um, the, our biological systems are dr drawers to connect. So mothers, when they have their newborns, they both have um, hormones within their bodies which um, flood their systems if they are in connection with each other. And those hormones don't, don't disappear. So there's a study out this week um, showing that hugging a stranger or even stroking... May I? 
Stop pleasing. Stroking in, in a positive way, rather than in a jabby way, a positive stroke actually releases, you may not know this, but you've just had a little flood of oxytocin. Really and and a, a, a reduction or um, having no hugs for weeks, can you imagine having no physical contact for weeks, that reduction in those positive love hormones, as they are called sometimes, has an impact on the rest of your bodily systems. And so, yes, loneliness does directly harm our health. And if health bodies aren't recognizing that and taking responsibility where they can, then it's going to be an even harder job for any of you who are stuck in your house when you're 70 for four weeks on end, not speaking to anyone, to find, what was it? We have to be left to, let, to sort these things out ourselves. Try it. You try it at 70 when you can't get out of the house. And there's no public health body looking out for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bev, um, I was intrigued by the point that was made around um, uh, the woman over here said she wasn't receiving counselling support at work, but was receiving uh, resilience training. And people have talked about resilience as being something about drawing on their own resources. So it's, it, there seems to be a shift in this notion of what resilience means. It's, it's as if you, you go somewhere and you, and you take resilience from, out, from outside yourself and, 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 you, and you, from, a, from your employer perhaps, rather than drawing on your, your own resources. So as somebody who's worked uh, with the, the Samaritans and, and still does, perhaps you might have a view on that. Well, and anything else you've heard? I do, I do want to say something just on what Laura said in terms of being 17 and you know, trying to do it yourself. Because I think things have changed. Because I do remember being 17, um, 1987, and I remember thinking, I think I need some help, and going to the GP, and the GP just sort of trying to get rid of me, because there's a notion that, you know, kids will go through things, especially when you consider the circumstances, you know, maybe, you know, you're learning to, to be an adult and um, you're living autonomously on your own, coming home to the house and, and not having the same support that you had. And there is a certain crisis in that for young people. You know, any change in your life has a form of, cri you know, it has a form of uh, something difficult that you've got to get used to. So, you know, the GP says, look, come back in a few weeks if you're still feeling like this. And I think that come back in a few weeks has changed. You know, there's, there's, I think, a notion of, oh, OK, well, let's get straight on it. And I, th I think people do need to have time to deal with things. And I don't necessarily think that the answer is always in, you know, gaining some form of condition um, or being told that maybe you're going through anxiety. I think we need to normalise the idea that sometimes life's a bit tricky. Um, and I, I think that support, you know, having someone to talk to, I think is, is, is a wonderful thing. That's why I love Samaritans. I think it's a great charity. I uh, recommend anyone here who's interested in volunteering, you know, have a look at it. And it's just about, you know, the fact that people, you know, can phone 24 seven and speak to someone in confidence. And I think sometimes life gets hard for everybody and they just want to get something off their chest. But it, I, I don't think it necessarily has to become an intervention after that, that point. And I think that there's, I think people are more resilient than, than we give them credit for. And I think it's, it's just, you know, it, it's an sort of automatic thing that kicks in often and we don't think about it. And trying to teach resilience is a bit odd, I, I think. Okay. Laura, you want to come back? I do. Please make it brief. Um, you can. Oh, just for clarity, I yeah. meant 70, oh, 70. Sorry. Um, but also, I think resilience absolutely has to be available as a teachable thing. I think, I think it's tricky to take um, something that seems so innate, that those of us who have got it, who are resilient, I think there's at least one of us on the panel who, who's incredibly resilient, um, it must become second nature, but being able to break it down into those, you know, facing your demons, ability to focus your mind, ability to spend time with people we haven't chosen. How many of us have actually even thought about those things? It's, for me, it's such, this, and I think this is why the mindfulness movement has grown so rapidly and so large. Um, we are, many of us are grasping with our in, grappling with our in, inner demons and grasping for something that keeps us steady. And it's, I totally agree with you. I think we should be normalizing um, 
fleeting feelings of loneliness. How many of us have felt lonely? Sorry, Sorry to no, do the no, chair. No right, okay, okay, loads, <laughs> loads of us, fantastic. And, th and that you admit to it because there's a huge stigma around it. But it, there's a huge difference between feeling lonely fleetingly or, you know, coming into university. Like, I remember that feeling of just being completely alone, like the pebble on the beach and all these kids around me, all these young people around me and not knowing who to talk to. Um, I'm going to have to close you down. So, sorry, because we, we, I do need to move to the other side of the panel and then go back out again. Sorry, Laura. Um, I just wanted to come back on this question that was raised about the being, um, for, from a young person in the audience, about there being lots of uh, networks out there, lots of relationships, opportunities to draw on support, but that doesn't necessarily make you less lonely. Now, that might count what you were saying, Christopher, yeah. and then Josh, afterwards, you might want to say something as well. I think it relates back to this theme of can you teach resilience. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to call it resilience. Um, I would want to call it just being human. Um, I think part of the problem is that um, we've lost faith in the existence of a metaphysical world as being an innate part of being human. So I noticed that, I mean, I think what Laura is talking about is really important and interesting, but it is quite sort of reductionist materialism, like, you know, it causes disease and it's bad for our health and so on. Those things are all true, but what about if we reframe it and we say, look, those aspects of life that you cannot see, touch, or measure are real. And that's one of the most difficult things to say in our contemporary culture. And I think that, so we talk about teaching resilience. I don't want to say it's just about teaching people to be fully human, which includes engaging with their interior world, that world which cannot be measured or seen or touched, but which is utterly real. And I think one of the difficulties is uh, there's a tendency, at least to make an assumption, in education, that that stuff is all a matter of opinion. You know, the only stuff that's really solid is stuff we can measure. And so those other hidden dimensions are just a matter of opinion, or there must be something wrong with me because I experience them very strongly. I experience emotions, love, uh, loneliness, and so on. And so this must be slightly odd. Whereas actually that is the stuff of being human, and we have to teach people from a young age to enter it to rejoice in it and to learn how to engage with that, including with other people. And that's what where a, a strong community of fellowship can actually be really important because I'm learning to engage with people who are, who are not people I would have chosen, but I'm learning at the same time to be at home in myself so I can let them be at home in themselves. And being at home in myself is what I would call resilience. Okay, thank you. Josh. Um, yeah, on the point about being lonely even though you have lots of social networks or, or, or whatever. Um, so I recently ended a three-year relationship and one of the ways I kind of dealt with that afterwards was by reconnecting with a lot of friends I maybe hadn't been able to see so much while I was with my ex. Um, I'm phrasing it as reconnecting in that kind of slightly uh, high-minded way because I'm sitting next to the abbot. What I mean is going to loads of parties. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I've had a lot of fun. Um, but... Uh, you don't find that that kind of uh, fixes a lot of what's missing when you when you leave a relationship. And the only thing that I've found so far that does is sort of getting back involved with various creative projects of my own that I dropped um, uh, sort of in the last few years. Um, and I guess there's something about doing something creative that is about sort of communing with yourself and learning to kind of talk to and be interested in yourself. Um, and that that is one way to sort of uh, approach the kind of questions we've been talking about. I would say, though, that I think it's sensible to draw a distinction between the kind of loneliness that I'm talking about there, i.e. a young, um, uh, mobile man with lots of friends who just feel a bit sad sometimes, and uh, chronic loneliness um, w where people who might be, for various health reasons, completely removed. So I think maybe those have different uh, solutions as problems. Thanks. I, I just wanted to... Uh, I'm trying to work out in my own mind that like the panel to help me to identify what you think is new about this discussion or what's new about what's happening in society. I mean, there's, there's always been old people, there's always been young people. People have always had experiences of loneliness, but what, what's, what, what's driving the discussion today? I mean, it, one thing that, one possible thing might be that we have higher expectations of our own happiness. That might be a positive thing, that we have a lower threshold of misery. Um, that, that could be a good thing. Or, or, or maybe what's, what's, what's encouraging people to hold back? I mean, I'm interested in this 
image of a, a student at university who doesn't want to go out. So, so, so what's holding them back? Is, is there a, a higher level of distrust of themselves and of others that means they won't make this leap to socialise? Um, so, so just what's new, really? Yes, thank you. I was very interested by what everyone said, and in particular what the abbot said about not being able to teach resilience, but rather than have a discussion about what it is to be human. And also, um, bearing in mind what the first speaker said, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name, about when you met the, um, the lady when you were on a kibbutz who was a Holocaust survivor. My mother's a Holocaust survivor. She wouldn't call herself that. She lived in occupied Paris during the war. She is a Holocaust survivor. She managed to escape and survive with her parents and her brother. She has suffered from very extended periods of depression and loneliness through her life. She wouldn't necessarily attribute it to some of her experiences in her childhood. She was 10 when the war broke out. But what I think is significant is that she modeled to me and my sister as we were growing up, enormous resilience. We very rarely spoke about the war. I didn't even know I was Jewish till I was, a, till I was 16, so that's a whole other conversation to be had. But what she did model to us is that life does have its ups and its downs. You can get through enormous trauma with resilience, fellowship, help, a lot of good luck, etc. And what the gentleman behind me just mentioned now about expectation, I think is enormously relevant in that her expectations were grounded in a much smaller community. So she didn't have the whole social media thing, which I'm surprised hasn't been mentioned just yet, but is undoubtedly bubbling just under the surface. I have five children, three of them are teenagers, and the whole social media platform and element in their lives, I feel contributes massively to their experience, both in terms of their expectations of what their lives should be like, and in terms of how they deal with problems, and in particular social problems of rejection, loneliness, relationship breakdown, and, and so forth. I teach resilience. I'm a primary school teacher. I teach reception in year one, and um, they come and they say, oh, um, she won't play with me. And I say, oh, well, go and find someone else to play with. And, um, and actually, you know, <laughs> that it's uh, the only way you can teach resilience is by sending the children back out into the playground to find someone else to play with. And parents do actually come in, and they say, you know, so-and-so, she's really sad because her friend won't play with her. And I say to the parents, well, you know, is my job to tell that other child that they've got to play with your child, or is my job to very... I know it's hard, and it really hurts your feelings, and it hurts your child's feelings, but my job is to send them back out there to have another go, um, because that is what's going to teach them the resilience that they need. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing. Is, um, just, I, I just wondered whether we could unpick things a bit. Um, my mum got chronically ill, um, and she had to give up work, and I always remember... Um, going to work myself and thinking, oh, God, she must be feeling so bad and, oh, you know, she can't work anymore and all of this kind of thing. And every time I phoned her, she'd moved on a bit and found something else to do. And I was kind of grieving for her not being able to go to work and she was getting on with it. Um, but she, she then, as she got iller and iller, she ended up in um, sheltered accommodation but wouldn't go down and sit with all the other women who were downstairs having coffee mornings and all of that kind of thing, because she was like, they're all old people, I don't want to talk to them. And it just made me think that actually, you know, the thing about making connections um, and, you know, the pebbles on the beach and all of that, probably your woman who was bereaved would have been better off having a conversation with me um, when I lost my mum. You know, and, and I think sometimes what we do is we create... Um, structures, we go, oh, all the old people, we'll, we'll take them all on a day trip to Southend and we'll have a Christmas party. But actually, maybe they don't want to connect in that way to other people. And maybe we need to be a bit more creative in the way that um, connections happen between people. Just on the question of the, should loneliness be seen as a health problem? And I mean, I'm not sure whether it's a social problem or not, actually, but I do think there is a problem with seeing it all in that language of health, because I think the way that you describe it, Laura, is that it individualizes it even more. And I think, you know, whether loneliness is a social problem, I don't know. But I think individuation is a problem. The kind of breaking down of bonds between people, which I think, I mean, is more of a cultural phenomenon rather than anything else. But what, you know, a lot of what we're seeing in discussions like these is a sort of an attempt to find individual responses to a changing context, which I think probably a lot of the time just fuel the problem. 
So, um, I mean, I also work in the university. It's like a plague of us. You know, and I spend a lot of time dealing with first-year students. Um, and it is interesting what, what you were saying about uh, this sort of notion now that as you know, the grown-up who the 18-year-old comes to see and wants a little weep, kind of you're supposed to just sort of send them on their way to counselling. Really what we should be doing is kind of dealing with the challenge and letting them have a little weep. We can't go giving them a little stroke because you get fired. You know, and, <laughs> and, that's, and that's the problem. And we've seen a load of interventions, I think, that are really about fueling the problem of in individuation and particularly between the generations, which I think do make this problem worse and make it much more difficult for us to sort of just behave spontaneously within communities to other people. So I really like your point. I don't, I don't know whether to call you the Abbott or Abbott Jameson, or, but I thought your point about um, not dealing with just friends and family and what's, what's happened is a, is a symptom of that. But also what you seem to be saying is that while we have to draw on our own resources, it's also about thinking about something beyond ourselves that we've lost. I mean, whether it's you know, religious religion for some people, or it might be politics, and it, another example that someone used. And when you just kind of have a process of trying to make connections without thinking, well, we need to kind of get out of ourselves a bit more, um, I think we're always going to be limited then in terms of the kind of solutions that we can come up with. Does anybody want to kind of respond to any of these points? I, I, I just think remembering the first question, the, the, the questioner who was saying, you know, why is this more of a problem than it used to be? Is it more of a problem than it used to be? I think that's a really good question. But I think the next three contributions began to give some possible answers to that, which was, I thought, a wonderful interaction for the, for, for the way this is working. Um, you know, the, and I thought that last point about individuation not quite sure what meaning you're giving to that because because it's quite a word in psychotherapy but it's not individualism as well no individuation you're sticking with individuation okay but i i think um i i think that that the context is the problem is a really important point and and i do think that going back then to that opening question i do think the way that our culture has understand itself understands itself now is part of the problem and, and i think it's very hard then to know how you address that so that the the work that's done by by laura and beverly is absolutely crucial to deal with the problems but if we were going to do this in terms of prevention we might say well actually the culture's got to make the shifts and i think that the, how on earth you create culture shifts nowadays in our highly individualized <laughs> culture is really problematic and it, you get government things like nudging you know the the, the 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 government's got a nudging unit hasn't it that tries to nudge us to do things um, I, I just think to name that as a problem for me is really important and that those old models of fellowship their absence is now being felt in ways that we never understood and that the 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 uh, the old fellowships, how will we replace them, is to me one of the critical cultural questions of our time. And loneliness is a symptom of our inability to find a way to answer that. Does anybody else want to come back on any of those comments? Yeah. You're sort of picking up on that. It does seem, particularly responding to the first question, I suppose, it does seem like there are various um, large trends here that are changing the way um, social connections work in society. It would probably be too simplistic to use that word atomized, which people often use, because things like social media can bring people together. But in any rate, the way that uh, our social networks are structured is shifting massively and will probably continue to shift. Um, when we look at trends like, for example, um, automation in the workplace, there are a lot of people doing a lot of work about um, how exactly we respond to that across society, all the different um, sort of policy responses that something like that is going to require. Um, on the issue of sort of social network shifting and uh, atomization and, and individuation, I did quite like that word actually, um, there's maybe not been the same amount of work done, not just on how do we respond to this one symptom of it, which is loneliness, but on how do we respond to a society that is going to look entirely different and how do we build uh, resilience and good networks within that um, it, as it continues to change. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, Beth? Yeah, um, I mean, just looking at the, the idea of society being seen in a sort of negative way, 
I mean, every, every time someone does something nice, you often see, you know, something on Facebook saying someone did this amazing thing. We, it's, it's almost like we don't expect people to be as empathetic and, and as helpful to their neighbour as we might think. I even think maybe Christopher <laughs> underestimates how um, neighbourly and ha how, how many good neighbours people do have. I think we, we have a very pessimistic view of um, society. And, and maybe, because um, I do agree with him on the points of fellowship, I do think that there is a gap and the friends and family become the dominant things. And that's possibly, I, I, don't, I don't have the answer for this, but it may well be because we're going through quite a big social change at the moment. I think the political parties that we've got maybe don't reflect um, people, you know, that there's, there's a sort of empty quality to them and people are not as connected. So, you know, having, having, having things in common politically or, or through class as, as it used to be as well, when, when that all goes, I think it kind of does leave um, a vacuum. And just the final thing, on social media, having two teenage girls as well who love social media, Snapchat, they're on it. I, d I think we overestimate how negative social media is on young people because um, my children really enjoy being on it. They they um, are able to connect with their friends 24-7. And they do come off it to have meaningful social engagement with their friends. So it's often seen as people are losing the ability to socialise because they're doing it all virtually. But when it means something to them, they come off and they touch and they talk and they spend lots of time you know, in their bedrooms with, with their friends uh, engaging. And again, you know, we, we look at it in a negative way. And I don't think we should. Thank you. Uh, Laura, do you want to respond to any of those comments? I think a few were aimed at you. Yes. What has changed? Um, sorry, actually, what hasn't changed is the percentage of older people who feel chronically lonely. So over the last five decades, that percentage has stayed the same. But um, demographically, the number of the, sh the proportion of older people in our society is growing. Um, and so what is changing is, are the real numbers. Um, so it's 1.2 million older people who feel chronically lonely today. In another 10 years, 20 years, that will grow. Um, what some of the drivers behind um, loneliness, the things that might have changed over those, uh, those five decades are things like space design, just coming way back to the first set of questions, and the way that um, inner cities uh, have been redesigned in, in that time um, and potentially haven't allowed spaces for people to come together. Absolutely, technology is in there, is in the mix. And I think if technology is enable meaningful connections, then research has shown that they are actually um, healthy and productive in terms of um, uh, preventing loneliness. And um, uh, transience um, has in increased over those last five decades, where people <coughs> are, are much more likely to move away from their parents, grandparents, and the place of birth, and regularly move. But the thing that ha another thing that hasn't changed, just going back to my first point, is the need, really, for a quality of connection. It's, it's about you know coming back to the pebble. If that pebble had one other pebble, just one, it's not about being surrounded by millions. But on the other side, um, it's about expectations. And you know, loneliness has been shown to be um, a d difference between the, the quality of connections you have, um, sorry, the quality of connections you have, which would be down here, and the expectations or the need that you have. And so we have two options. We can either increase the quality and the number of connections, or we can, through resilience, um, frankly, lower your expectations and allow you to be um, more at peace and happy with, with solitude. OK, thank you. I'll go out once more. Well, just on that last point, which is the, first, was the second thing I wanted to say, was that I love being on my own and um, always have. And I ponder, I read. I, on the few moments that I get the chance to be alone, that's what I do. I don't go and visit monks. I actually pay to go um, to the seaside and stay in a hotel for a couple of days. And it's really, really lovely. And I think that seeing lonely, being on your own is part of the problem, as part of the problem, <coughs> is part of the problem. Because people, it is stigmatized. Um, it has always been stigmatized. If you want to be on your own, people have thought that you were a bit odd. 
It doesn't mean that you're antisocial. It doesn't mean that you're weird or that you don't like people. It just means you want to be on your own for a bit. And perhaps if people had a better attitude to solitude, we would have a better attitude to being on your own. That would make it easier for people who feel lonely to say that they feel lonely because it wouldn't be seen as some kind of problem. And I think this problematizing being on your own is part of the problem. The first thing I wanted to say is that just because something manifests itself as a health problem doesn't mean the cure is a health cure. And um, I think individuation, um, what you were describing as the lack of fellowship, um, those things, the old ways are gone, but that doesn't mean that we can't look at the majority of older people and people in general who are not lonely, see what they're doing, and, and spread it out a bit. Okay, thank you very much. Um, My point um, goes on from that last point a, a little bit, I think, um, because I think being lonely is not about being alone at all, but it's about a sense of connection to society around you. And one of the things that uh, worries me is that we're losing that sense of connection. So just a quick example, one of my um, elderly neighbors, unfortunately he passed away, but he used to spend his time sitting in his window, looking at the children play. And I went round to see him once and he said, but I'm not, you know, I love just sitting here watching all the children play outside. So he was sitting on his own in his house watching the children play and he didn't feel lonely. Now the children didn't go and talk to him or anything or acknowledge him. He was just connected to the children playing by watching them. And I think one of the problems that we've got today is that pe people actually feel defensive. Like an old man sitting in a window watching children play is no longer seen as a positive thing of engagement with society. It's seen as a, a negative thing. And just a, another quick pass. Point Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there because we've got a minute left. Hi, I have quite a few issues with what's been going on today. I'd firstly like to bring out the point of being forced to be on your own and being wanting to be on your own, which I feel are very two significantly different points. Secondly, I'd like to change the characterization of, like, I go to a university, I'm a university student, and I'd like to quite change the characterization of how lonely students and lonely young people have been characterized like these discussions. And I feel if you're going to speak to someone and you want help with this, it's not that you're looking for someone else to blame, it's that you genuinely do not want to be on your own anymore. And picking up the courage to go and talk to someone about that is an incredibly hard thing to do. And it's not a snowflake generation wanting to blame someone else. It's that I feel I need help. And I can totally see how being on your own can spiral into forgetting how to socialize, then being too scared to go and do it, then developing into other forms of depression, which can be hugely dangerous. So yes, you might have people who, oh, I feel like blaming someone else today. But I'd rather have that than having so many more students fall into depression and anxiety. And then a point on social media about how, yes, social media can be a really great thing, but the problem with it isn't that you're trying to, um, you're forgetting how to socialize. A big problem with social media is how you see everyone else around you socializing. On Snapchat, you suddenly see within seconds, every single person you know, all at this social gathering that you then feel incredibly excluded from because you can't hide this from people anymore. Um, and that can seriously contribute to loneliness. You're sitting alone in your room, or see everyone you know at your school Saturday night out together. That is a huge problem with loneliness. It's the rate me Snapchats that are going around. It's not the fact that people are still forgetting how to socialize. It's the forms of socialization which are then impacting other people on that. So, okay. yeah. I thought your uh, points there were, were really good. Um, and I think in terms of the whole therapy and counseling question, um, as someone who's been to therapy several times myself, um, partly because I was lonely at the time, I, I think it's, um, it could, it, it can be a way of someone helping you to take control of your own situation. So if you are uh, on your own, your therapist can help you to work out how to build better connections with other people. So I think that um, there has maybe, it, it, I think that we're right to say that a lot of the work for some people who are lonely has to be done by themselves, but that also means that other people can help them to learn how to do that work, whether it's through therapy or, or something else. Christopher. Thank you. Um, I, I, I take the point about being alone voluntarily and being alone because you've chosen it. I think I, my final point would be, I think we can enable people to, to be comfortable at home in themselves being alone to a, a higher degree than many people uh, are, are currently able to do. And that's not denying that those who do experience it as tra a traumatic loneliness do need help. But I hope that through a mixture of uh, the wisdom of other people and fellowship, 
people can learn to be more, more people can learn to be at ease being alone. Laura. You've heard me use the 1.2 million. So they are chronically lonely people who do absolutely need support and need to feel that they can stand up and not be stigmatized um, when they say they're lonely. But there are a further 3 million older people who um, would benefit from a great deal of kindness. We haven't mentioned that word, you know, that, that genuine short-lived connection between your neighbors or your friends, people you see fleetingly. And there are further 6 million people who aren't lonely at all, but they could probably still do with being kind to each other, feeling part of a community, and building their own resilience. So I think resilience, for me, is the big takeaway, is the big, um, it's the thing that we all need to learn or um, grow or um, uh, foster in ourselves. But I would still stand by those chronically lonely people who absolutely need to be supported through um, something that could damage their health. Thank you. Uh, Beverly. Yep. I'm kind of coming down on the, the fact that I think loneliness is a social problem, um, but it's no worse today. That's, that's my thoughts on it. What I think is different is our sense of community and solidarity. Um, I think that, that we're viewing society as in crisis, and that might be because of the fellowship issue, which was you know, well defined by Christopher. Um, but I do think that what we have in spades is empathy and, um, you know, a sense of common shared, you know, con emotion for people. I think uh, if, you, if you go out there today, there are loads of people helping people, you know, just talking to people, doing errands for people who can't get out. And I think we should celebrate the fact that that you know, people are pretty good, and I don't think there are any issues with, uh, with people wanting to help each other. So um, please, we found the panel. I think it leads to an excellent discussion, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you.